Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. Now, while this chapter that we're going to study in Genesis is primarily a genealogical listing, there's more to be gained from it than you might think. Now, we learn much about tribal society and how families are mixed and even the politics of the area of the era. So while this might seem like a nice time to just kind of mentally turn off, I recommend that this may be one of those times that you take in a little bit more caffeine and pay a lot of co close attention um, and take lots of notes. I, mean, I think it's going to help you a lot down the line. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 36. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 39. We're going to read the whole chapter, Genesis chapter 36. This is the genealogy of Esau, that is Edom. Esau chose Canaanite women as his wives. Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Aholivama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zion the uh, Hivite. Basmat, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Naviot. Adah bore to Esau Eliphaz. Basmat bore Reuel. A holy, uh, a holy Vama bore Yehush, Yalam, and Korach. These were the sons of Esau born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, the others in his household, his cattle and other animals, everything else he owned, which he had acquired in the land of Canaan, went off to a country distant from his brother Jacob. For their possessions had become too great for them to live together, and the countryside through which they were traveling couldn't support so much livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. This is the genealogy of Esau, the father of Edom, in the hill country of Seir. The names of Esau's sons were Eliphaz, son of Adah, the wife of Esau, and Reuel, the son of Basmat, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Tsepho, Gatam, and Kanaz. Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. The sons of Reuel were Nachat, Zerach, Shema, and Mitzah. These were the sons of Basmat, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Oholivama, Ahol, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of uh, Zivon, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau Yehush, Yalam, and Korach. The chieftains of the sons of Esau were the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chieftains of Taman, Omar, Tsepho, Kanaz, Korach, Getam, and Amalek. These were the chieftains descended from Eliphaz and Edom and from Adah. The sons of Reuel, Esau's sons, were the chieftains of Nachat, Zerach, Shema, and Mizah. These were the chieftains descended from Reuel in the land of Edom and from Basmat. Esau's wife. The sons of Aholivama, Esau's wife, were the chieftains of Yehush, Yalam, and Korach. These were the chieftains descended from Aholivama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These were the descendants of Esau, that is Edom, and these were their chieftains. These were the descendants of Seir, the Horite, the local inhabitants. Lotan, Shoval, Sivon, Anna, Dishon, Etzer, and Dishon. These were the chieftains descended from the Horites, the people of Seir and the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Hori and Hemam. Lotan's sister was Timna. The sons of Shoval were Alvan, Manachat, Eval, Shfo, and Onam. The sons of Sivon were Aya and Anna. This is the Anna who found the hot springs of the desert while pasturing his father Zivon's donkeys. The children of Anna were Dishon and Oholivama, the daughter of Anna. The sons of Dishon were Hemdan, Eshban, Yitron, and Kron. The sons of Etzer were Bilhan, Zavan, and Akan. The sons of Dishon were Uts and Aran. These were the chieftains descended from the Horites, the chieftains of 
Lotan, Shoval, Zivan, Anad, Dishon, Etzer, and Dishan, they were the chieftains descended from the Horites by their clans in Seir. Following are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king had reigned over the people of Israel. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. The name of his city was Dinhava. When Bela died, Yobab, the son of Zerach from Botsra, reigned in his place. When Yobab died, Husham from the land of the Temani reigned in his place. When Husham died, Hadad, the son of Bedad, who killed Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his place. The name of his city was Avit. When Hadad died, Samla of Masrekah died, uh, reigned in his place. And when Samla died, Shaul of Rechavot by the river reigned in his place. When Shaul died, Baal uh, Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. And when Baal Hanan died, Hadar reigned in his place. The name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mehet Avel, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahav. These are the names of the chieftains descended from Esau according to their clans, places, and names. The chieftains of Timna, Alva, Yetet, Oholbima, Elah, Pinon, Kenaz, Teman, Mivtar, Magdiel, and Iram. These were the chieftains of Eden according to their settlements and the land they owned. This is Esau, the father of Edom. Well, that's a mouthful. This is called the generations of Esau. And at this point in the Old Testament, we can say that the personal history of the patriarchs ends. And the history of Israel, the 12 tribes, begins with the next chapter. Now let's remember that whenever we hear Jewish or Christian scholars speak of the biblical patriarchs, or the Bible uses the term patriarchs or fathers, it nearly is always speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, occasionally, we'll hear of the patriarchs of each of the 12 tribes, but that's referring to each tribe's namesake, like, pardon me, Reuben, Levi, Judah, so on. Now, what we can readily see here is that Esau had many children, and that it is clearly spelled out that Esau and Edom are, A, one and the same individual, and B, that Esau, the brother of Jacob, is the founder of all the Edomite tribes. And C, he is the namesake of the land of Edom. And D, that Mount Seir is in the land of Edom, and that the, and that the terms Seir and Edom are usually interchangeable. Speaking of the same place. So basically, when we hear the Bible speak of the land of Seir, or Mount Seir, or Edom, it's the same place, and that's the southeastern end of the Dead Sea. Now, one of the purposes of these long genealogical listings is to show us the prophetic blessings of Isaac, what they had over the, his twin sons of Esau and Jacob, or they were in the process of coming to pass. Let's review this blessing of Genesis chapter 27, verses 38 to 40. I'm going to use the by the way, the NAS Bible, because it's, it's, it's a more literal rendition. In 27, beginning with verse 38, And Esau said to his father, Isaac, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. So Esau lifted his voice and he wept. And then Isaac, his father, answered him and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling away from the dew of heaven from above. And by your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now most of your Bibles will not say away from the fertility of the earth, but instead they just leave out the word away making it that Esau will live in a fertile place where there is abundant moisture. It's long been known by Jewish and Hebrew scholars that it was rabbinic tradition 
that the word away was removed from the text, showing sympathy and understanding for Esau in his having been tricked out of his birthright uh, and his blessing. But in fact, the earliest Hebrew manuscripts plainly show that it was away from the fertility and away from the moisture that Esau would live. And of course, that's exactly where Esau went. It matches perfectly with history to a place known as the Erbah, which is a desert. Now, it should got, not go unnoticed that Esau continued with his profane ways that God, in his foreknowledge, knew he would. So he took away Esau's birthright and removed him from the line of promise even before he was born. Now, from here on in the Bible, Old Testament and New, Esau and Edom are generally associated symbolically with unrighteousness and rebellion. And it gets more so as we leave the Torah and we move into the later books of the Old Testament. Yet some deference is paid to Esau because in Deuteronomy 23, Moses orders the Israelites not to abhor an Edomite. So an Edomite is a descendant of Esau because they are kinsmen of Israel. So frankly, there is this almost schizophrenic remembrance of Esau in the Bible, at once aligning him with the unrighteous and the wicked, and at the same time reminding Israel that the descendants of Esau are kinsmen. So Israel shouldn't hate Esau or hate his descendants. Now this kind of rationale is pretty difficult for the Western mind to understand because we look at family relationships, more from the European extended and then later nuclear family viewpoint. But we must remember that the entire Bible talks about family, family relationships from the Middle Eastern tribal viewpoint. I want to say that again, from, Gen from Genesis to Revelation. The context of family and nation in the Bible is tribal. So we have to be very careful not to just willy-nilly project our modern Western family views and societal structures into our understanding of the Old and New Testaments. In the news of the Middle East, which dominates, I think, our TV screens 24 hours a day, we endure these frustrating realities whereby the, the Sunni Muslims will blow up the Shiite Muslim mosques, and vice versa. And some Shiites will kill other Shiites. Some Sunnis will kill other Sunnis. And Iran Shiites war against the Iraqi Shiites, and so on and so forth. And yet, when the U.S. comes to aid one of them to stop the horror, the others suddenly turn on the United States claiming brotherhood. It's true. That's how it works. Now from Afghanistan, although the news from there barely makes a blip on the radar screen currently, we still hear of one warlord fighting against another, war, another warlord, the U.S. siding with yet a third, and then suddenly it all shifts around. And the U.S. finds itself fighting against people who only yesterday fought alongside us as allies. This is because these warlords are simply tribal leaders, doing what they've always done, attempting to gain dominance for their tribe, which is the primary job of any tribal leader. I remember the first war against Saddam Hussein, the war of the elder President Bush. And hearing the representatives of various Arab nations saying that they did not want to go against Saddam, because even with his invasion of Kuwait, it was simply his bad behavior. Something that deserved admonishment, but not destruction. They saw him as a brother who was misbehaving, causing trouble for his extended family. 
They did not regard him as a ruthless dictator threatening the stability of the world. And even though these people will viciously attack and kill one another, it is in the end an age-old battle for tribal dominance in their minds. It's normal. It's to be expected. That's the system. It's not something to be stopped or to be changed. It's an ancient way of life that has existed since time immemorial and is preferred for perhaps the majority, certainly the leadership, of the Middle Eastern peoples and nations. This is why these Middle Eastern nations that seem to absolutely hate one another commit genocide upon one another, will each contribute to fighting against the United States and Europe. Because they see themselves as extensions of Esau and Ishmael. And therefore, they're all one big family. This is the mentality we deal with throughout, we deal with throughout the Bible. So, Esau is a bad boy. And Ishmael is not the chosen one. But they are still, in the larger tribal sense, distant kinsmen, distant family of Israel. But looking even closer, we find that a rather ironic situation develops. All of Esau's sons were born inside the Promised Land, while Jacob's sons were born outside the Promised Land. Esau's sons were born in Canaan. Jacob's were born in Mesopotamia. Yet, in revealing his full character, Esau took his family and removed them from the blessing of the Promised Land, while Jacob took his family and brought them into the blessing of the Promised Land. Isn't that interesting? I mean, what incredible symbolism we have here. I mean, what a terrible fate awaits those who know, whose family knows God. But the family leader removes them from faith, teaching, and fellowship. And what an equally wonderful blessing to the family leader who takes his family that up to now has existed outside of God's blessing, but leads them into it. Now, to add to this irony, isn't it amazing that in God's great plan for the people of Israel, Jacob, that were born into God's promises for them, and they were to be the inheritors of all of God's promises, yet they rejected it and in general moved away, so to speak. At the same time, Gentiles born outside the promises, born as non-inheritors, were through Yeshua given an opportunity to move in to the promised land and become co-inheritors with Israel. It's Esau and Jacob all over again. And as I've taught you since Genesis 1, this is but a God pattern. And when God establishes a pattern, He sticks with it. Well, let's move on. We see many sons and grandsons, great-grandsons, of Esau that's documented in Genesis 36. And of course, these are mentioned because they would each have created their own, own named tribe. Some of these names we'll see later in the Old Testament, particularly during and after the exodus from Egypt. But notice something in verses 38 and 39. There is a fellow, a descendant from Esau named Baal Hanan. This is just further concrete evidence of the rebellion and the idolatry practiced by Esau and his descendants. Because since time immemorial, it has been the practice of the tribes of the Middle East to adopt the name of the chief god they worship as part of their family name. Here we see the familiar name Baal, a Canaanite word for the now deified Nimrod attached to one of Esau's progeny. This son, and I'm sure several others, were Baal worshippers, and they were proud of it. But we learn some other things that are useful when we dissect this genealogy chart a little bit. First, though, let me address something that, is, that a sharp student of the Bible texts 
will catch. The descendants and the wives, as listed in Genesis 26, don't match with the ones given us here in 36. And as scholars have struggled with this, they've come to some various conclusions about why that's so. For instance, the three wives listed for Esau in Genesis 26 are Judith, Basmat, and Mahalat. Here in Genesis 36, the wives are listed as Ada, Basmat, and a holy Yama. I can't ever say this, this is a hard one. A holy Yama. The only agreement between these two chapters is Basmat. And even then, she's assigned to a different father. She's the daughter of Elon the Hittite in Genesis 26. She's the daughter of Ishmael in, Ge in Genesis 36. Now, obviously, we have renderings of family lines from two different viewpoints here. More and more scholars begin to stop trying to view the Bible from the European Western mindset and start viewing it for what it is a Middle Eastern, tribal, Semitic, Hebrew document, some of these issues start to clear up. For example, when we look at the New Testament ge genealogy of our Savior in different Gospels, we're going to see slightly different family tree listings. But as is now known and understood, that's because it was the Middle Eastern and Hebrew way to lay out a family tree based on genealogy and the succession of firstborns where when bloodlines are what matters, and a slightly different family tree list emphasizing leaders and kings of the tribe is used when what matters is rulership and tribal authority. These aren't in conflict with one another. With, a, with one another. It's really just a matter of the purpose that each family tree list was created to serve. Very likely, one of two things is happening with these two different lists of wives of Esau. Either some of the wives went by two different names, depending on the local language or where they were living at the time. Common thing, by the way, in that era. Or these were all different wives of Esau. It's just that a certain group of his wives' names were chosen for the historical records to document one purpose. And a different group of wives' names was selected to document a different purpose. Again, this was common and usual practice. Another influence that often causes a divergence in genealogical listings is when two prominent family groups begin to intermarry. So over time, the family lines blur. In our age, where divorce is pretty common, more common than not, really. It's usual that brothers and sisters living together can have different last names. And that's because in our society, a woman changes her last name to match that of her current husband, so the mother's last name is often different from the name of her own biological child. But whether the mother's last name matches that of her child is based on when her name was written down and for what purpose. If she was still married to the biological father of her children when her name was written down, then she and her children's last names will, will match. Later, if the woman divorces and remarries and then her name is written down, her last name probably won't match that of her children's, right? And then, of course, is the case where a biological father allows the new stepfather to adopt his children, so the children's last name is changed, and on and on and on with all this myriad of possibilities of name combinations. And while we understand all the complexities of names that, that are true for our society, so we don't think about the way the person's name might appear in different documents in terms of errors or conflicts, in the Bible era, Societies did similar things regarding name changes, but for different reasons. So in the Bible, we often get this jumble of overlapping names and name changes due to births and deaths and a widow marrying a husband of a different nationality, leveret marriage, the family relocating to another nation and adopting the local customs for naming people, 
the family dropping allegiance to one God, beginning allegiance to a new God, so on and so forth. Lots of different reasons. But what we need to notice from all this is that there is much intermingling by means of marriage going on <clears throat> between the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, and Esau, Isaac's son, Jacob's twin brother. It began very early on and it accelerated rapidly. It happened more so with some of the clans of each tribe, less so with others. The result is by the time we reach the New Testament era, the intermingling is substantial. It's hard to draw a distinction between a person who might call Esau his ancestor and one, pardon me, who would call Ishmael his ancestor. In Yeshua's day, as it is now, a true Arab, that is an Arabian, not just a person who speaks one of the many Arabic dialects, is generally a descendant of Ishmael. And most of the other Middle Eastern tribes are a mixture of Esau and Ishmael. The main exception being those of the northern Middle Eastern areas that have more Persian blood in them. The final thing we need to note before we move on is that we see the name of Amalek appear. Now Amalek appears as a very early enemy of Israel. And in fact, much is said in Exodus about the tribe of Amalek attacking Israel on their journey through the wilderness after leaving Egypt. Amalek was the product of Timnah, that was his mother, who was a Horite. In fact, Timnah was not a legal wife. She was a concubine. So she had an inferior status, which in turn gave Amalek an inferior family status in the tribal way of thinking. That Timnah was a Horite, which was a Canaanite tribe, and was joined to the Edomite tribe by means of marriage to Eliphaz, who was an Edomite, made Amalek an Edomite tribe, but inferior to some of the other descendants who married more closely within the family. Therefore, Amalek, though technically descendants of Esau, is really treated somewhat separately by the Holy Scriptures. Amalek is not considered kinsmen of Israel, while other descendants of Esau are considered descendants of Israel, or rather kinsmen of Israel. This reflects far more politics than traditions, and traditions than it does actual genealogy. And we're going to find out an awful lot of this sort of thing that goes on throughout Old Testament and New Testament Scripture. It's hard, but it's up to us to discover and understand what the Hebrew writers and the early readers of the Torah and the Hebrew Bible well understood about these nuances that are lost to us. So please, I, I don't want you to close your minds off and take a little snooze when we discover these historical, sociological, genealogical matters. Next only to the Holy Spirit and dwelling in us, these, believe it or not, these genealogies are the keys to actually grasping what the writings of the Bible mean how they will apply to our lives, and what's going to happen in the future. They're the keys. Okay, we're going to move on now to Genesis 37. And it's at this point in the Torah that the remaining chapters of Genesis are going to revolve around Joseph. The era of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is coming to a close. But more will be said about Joseph, and acts that focus on his life than any of the patriarchs. One could also say that it is at this point in the Torah that Israel becomes the center point, the focus for the first time. Israel is now presented as a separate people group. But as of chapter 37, they've not yet attained nation status. So as much as Joseph is front and center in the 13 remaining chapters of Genesis, why is Joseph not given the status as a patriarch like his father was? I can't really say for sure why that status is with Jacob and not with Joseph. 
But I can point to one outstanding fact that certainly is a marked change in the way Jehovah operates with the leader of the Hebrews. God had direct and two-way communication with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He delivered his instructions to the patriarchs by means of direct divine oracle. He did not do this with Joseph. Direct two-way communication was reserved for very special cases, and Joseph wasn't one of them. Over the next several chapters woven throughout this narrative, we're going to get a look at another one of God's governing dynamics. The first governing dynamic that we recognize was that of division, separation, and election. This would become God's device to achieve His goal of perfecting humanity and bringing mankind into unity with Himself. A word that we often hear in the church, sometimes in the synagogue, is sanctification. Sanctification is the act of God dividing, separating, and electing His people for purposes. Sanctification is the setting apart of certain human beings for Himself. A person set apart for God has been granted a special status, a holy status that places that person above the common in God's economy. Common is the status of the world. Holy is the status of those set apart for God. Israel was set apart for God, so they were and are holy. As a believer, you have been sanctified. That is, you have been divided, separated, and elected to become God's own children, to conform to His will, if you would, to serve Him. You have been declared holy. But in reality, believers are more like the set-apart tribe or the set-apart nation of Israel, and that set-apart tribe was Levi. Because we're told in the New Testament that believers of Yeshua are like His priesthood. This other governing dynamic of God is the one that we see the Lord employ when He deals with Joseph. That second, second governing dynamic I'd like to teach you about is called divine providence. That is, God works His will largely unseen and unknown to us. Yet, in our ignorance, we're actually party to it. Somehow, in the free exercise of our human wills, God guides mankind to the purposes and end He's decided back in eternity past. Yet often it seems though He isn't guiding anything at all. It even seems at times that God has created His creation and then has gone on to leave us on our own, allowing His creation to take whatever route destiny has for it. Further, many times it feels as though God could not possibly achieve His goals using the present circumstances. Yet without knowing it, divine providence is at work, moving towards its inevitable, unchangeable, preordained conclusion. And while we can see this dynamic in action within the lives of the patriarchs, albeit dimly at times, the story of Joseph is positively ablaze with observable divine providence. And of course, for us, it's more easily observable because we have something that Joseph and all the characters associated with this amazing journey that is Joseph's life didn't have. We have the benefit of hindsight. For while they were in the midst of it all, they just couldn't see it. Divine providence at work. And that is because one of the prime characteristics of divine providence is it's rarely observable by humans as it's unfolding. So now we've been introduced to two of God's governing dynamics. 
sanctification, the process of dividing, separating, and electing, and now divine providence, the unseen working out of God's will in humanity. With sanctification and divine providence in mind, let's now start to look at the life of Joseph. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. You have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 41. Genesis chapter 37. Yaakov, Jacob, continued living in the land where his father had lived as a foreigner, the land of Canaan. Here is the history of Jacob. When Yosef, Joseph, was 17 years old, he used to pasture the flock with his brothers, even though he was still a boy. And once when he was with the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph the most of all of his children because he was the son of his old age. And so he made him a long-sleeved robe. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they began to hate him. And it reached the point where they couldn't even talk with him in a civil manner. Now Yosef had a dream which he told his brothers and that made them hate him all the more. He said to them, listen while I tell you about this dream of mine. We were tying up bundles of wheat out in the field when suddenly my bundle got up by itself and it stood upright. Then your bundles came, gathered it around mine, and prostrated themselves before it. And his brothers retorted, yes, you will certainly be our king. You'll do a great job of bossing us around. And they hated him still more for his dreams and for what he said. He had another dream which he told his brothers. Here, I had another dream, and there were the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars prostrating themselves before me. He told his father too, as well as his brothers, but his father rebuked him. What is this dream you had? <laughs> Do you really expect me and your mother and your brothers to come and prostrate ourselves before you on the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now after this, when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's sheep in Shechem, Israel asked Joseph, Aren't your brothers pasturing the sheep in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. He said to him, Go now, see whether things are going well with your brothers and with the sheep, and bring back word to me. So he sent him away from the Hebron Valley, where, uh, and he went to Shechem, where a man found him wandering around in the countryside. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers, he answered. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the sheep? And the man said, well, they've left here because I heard them say, let's go to Dotan. Yosef went after his brothers and he found them in Dotan. Well, they spotted him in the distance. and Before he had arrived where they were, they had already plotted to kill him. They said to each other, look, this dreamer is coming. So come now, let's kill him. Throw him into one of these water cisterns here. Then we'll say some wild animals devoured him. We'll see then what becomes of his dreams. And when Reuben heard this, he saved him from being destroyed by them. He said, Should, we shouldn't take his life. Don't shed blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilds, but don't lay hands on him yourselves. He intended to rescue him from them later and restore him to his father. So it was that when Joseph arrived to be with his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the long-sleeved robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat their meal. But as they looked up, they saw in front of them a caravan of Ishmaelim, Ishmaelites, coming from Gilad, their camels loaded with aromatic gum and healing resin and opium on their way down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What advantage is it to us if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites instead of putting him to death with our own hands. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers paid attention to him. So when the Midianites, merchants, passed by, they drew and lifted Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for half a pound of silver shekels to the Yerushalayim, uh, Yishmaelim, right, Ishmaelites, who took Joseph out to Egypt. Reuben returned to the cistern, 
Upon seeing that Joseph wasn't in it, he tore his clothes in mourning, and he returned to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I go now? They took Joseph's robe, they killed a male goat, dipped the robe in blood, and then they sent the long sleeve robe and brought it to their father, saying, We found this. Do you know if this is your son's robe or not? He recognized it, and he cried, It is my son's robe. Some wild animal has torn Joseph into pieces and eaten him. Jacob tore his clothes, putting sackcloth around his waist. He mourned his son for many days. Though all his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, he refused all consolation, saying, No, I'll go down to the grave, to my son, mourning. And his father wept for him. In Egypt, the Midianites sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, a captain of the guard. <clears throat> well, with the outset of chapter 37, Joseph, who's second to the last of Jacob's sons, is 17 years old. He's living in Canaan, along with the rest of his brothers. And soon, though, he's going to wind up in Egypt. Now, here might be a good time to mention something that's a good calculator, and a little research brings it to light. Recall that at the end of chapter 35, it is recorded the death of Jacob's father, Isaac. And I told you then that Isaac had actually lived long enough to meet all of his grandchildren, all the, who would become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, Isaac also remained alive long enough to know of, J of Joseph's disappearance. But he didn't live long enough to learn of the outcome. As is not unusual in the scriptures, which isn't designed to be read like a novel, sometimes a statement will just kind of be laid out there, and we'll assume that that statement is necessarily attached to the verses just before it. In fact, that's often not the case. In Genesis 35, 27, we read of Jacob returning to Hebron and greeting his father Isaac. And in the next verse, we read that Isaac died at the age of 180, and that his sons Esau and Jacob attended to his funeral. As it turns out, verses 27 and 28 of chapter 35 weren't connected. They're simply two different statements of fact, one following the other. Jacob came home. Sometime later, Isaac died. And with a little basic math, we find out that Isaac died after Joseph had gone missing for 12 years. I'm not going to go through all the calculations for you, but if you're interested, here are the two ingredients, key ingredients. Jacob was 60 years younger than his father Isaac. So when Isaac died at 180, Jacob was 120 years old. The second thing to know is that Jacob died at 147 years old. Now, we'll let you figure out how to arrive with the proper timeline, because all the info necessary is in the next several pages. The first verse tells us something important. The destiny that Isaac had given to his twin sons in the blessing of them was now unfolding. Jacob now lived in the promised land. Esau has left it, living now away from fertile ground, away from regular rainfall. But another part of this prophetic blessing from a time earlier than Jacob even earlier than his father Isaac, is also near coming to pass. The Abrahamic blessing, that for a time the Hebrews would live as strangers in a foreign land and they would be oppressed. Remember what we read all the way back in Genesis 15, verse 13. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge that nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out of it with many possessions. Soon we're going to find out that the land that is not theirs, the place they will live in for 400 years, was Egypt. 
And in chapter 37, we're just a few years away until that prophetic, prophetic event actually becomes a bitter reality. And with that, we'll end here for this week. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.